Hello, and welcome back to the second session of our 2021 Fairfax County Housing Symposium. The theme of our next hour is affordable housing, a prescription for community health. We're happy to be joined by a panel of public and private sector leaders as we focus on the social determinants of health and how housing plays a key role in community wellness. To submit questions during this session, or if you are experiencing technical difficulties, please use the Q&A icon on your screen. We will be answering questions at the end of the session and we will try to address as many questions as we can in the time allotted. I'm delighted to introduce the moderator for the session, Dr. Ali Weinstein, Associate Professor of Global and Community Health at George Mason University and the Director of the Center for Study of Chronic Illness and Disability. Her research is focused on important contributors to health and recovery from illness and trauma with a broad context of medical psychology, depression, stress, physical activity, and exercise. Welcome, Dr. Weinstein. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really excited for this um, panel. So the way today is going to work is I'm going to offer just the briefest of introductory comments on the connection between housing and health to make sure we're all on the same page, and then I will get our awesome panelists to each get to talk individually about their connections, um, tell us a little bit about their organizations and how they connect with um, housing and health. And then we're gonna leave time at the end so we can have a, a fruitful sort of question and answer period. So please feel free to put those questions in the uh, question and answer icon because we'll get to them at the end. Um, so if I could have my slides, awesome, thank you. So again, the session is affordable housing and prescription for community health. Um, next slide, please. So uh, how do housing and health interact? I think the easiest way to think about it is through the lens of social determinants of health. Um, and the social determinants of health are really those non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. Um, and research has shown consistently um, that the social determinants of health can be more important than healthcare or lifestyle choices in influencing one's health. And I think we heard uh, that theme across the earlier sessions this morning. So we're really gonna focus in on here on that um, as housing and how it is a major contributor to the social determinants of health and therefore health in general. Next slide. So if you think of health being sort of the center or core of, of our being and me as a professor of community health likes to think of it that way. And um, we can think of it embedded into various layers of housing. There are conditions within the home, neighborhood conditions, and then housing affordability, which sort of encircles all of the other factors as well. Um, next slide. So just to provide some examples of what that would be like, um, for example, the physical conditions within one's home. So uh, is there lead paint? Um, are the pipes up to snuff? All of those sorts of things have direct impacts on one's health. Um, conditions in the neighborhood surrounding the homes. Um, I, as you heard, I'm very interested in exercise and physical activity. And is it safe to go walking in your neighborhood? Are there walking paths set up so that one can go walking? All those things have actually been shown to have uh, huge impacts on whether people are physically active. And in that case, in terms of their housing, uh, in terms of their health as well. And then um, housing affordability. So um, it obviously affects home and neighborhood conditions, but it also affects the overall ability of families to make healthy choices. Um, so I was lucky enough to work on a project directly with um, Fairfax County Housing where we did a needs assessment with residents in subsidized housing. And we heard that they make choices between filling their medication prescriptions and making timely payments on their mortgage. Um, those, are, those are decisions that we don't want people to make. Um, so it, the affordability really does have direct impacts on their ability to make those healthy choices. So therefore, if we really want to make um, a difference in strategies to be effective in increasing um, the healthiness of our communities, it needs to be multifaceted. Um, so improving quality and physical quality of the housing, uh, strengthening community, and again, community we heard about um, a couple times this morning, as well as increasing affordability, which again, we, we, we've heard about. So uh, I'm really excited to get to hear from our panel. You'll see it's a diverse group with different perspectives, um, uh, private and public 
on this connection between housing and health and how their organizations are, are um, um, approaching these problems. Um, so without further ado, you didn't come here to listen to me. So let's get to our speakers. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker is gonna be Dr. George Leventhal. And Dr. Leventhal earned his PhD in public policy from the University of Maryland. He also holds a master's degree in public administration from the Johns Hopkins University and a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from the University of California at Berkeley. He joined um, Kaiser Permanente in 2018, where he works as the Director of Community Health for the Mid-Atlantic Region. In this role, he develops policies for and provides oversight and support to a range of activities that address social determinants of health in the region, including access to healthcare for the uninsured, affordable housing, homelessness, food security, and behavioral health in schools. Prior to joining Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Leventhal served 16 years on the Montgomery County Council in Maryland. He was elected four times to the council and served as council president twice. He chaired the council's Health and Human Services Committee for many years and also served on the, on the council's Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Leventhal. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Um, can I be heard? Am I coming across okay? Terrific. So uh, we do have slides here. It's a, a great pleasure to be invited to speak at the Fairfax County Housing Symposium on behalf of our region's leading healthcare system, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we have just under 800,000 members in our mid-Atlantic region and just about 12 million members around the United States in our um, eight regions around the United States. Next slide. So um, Dr. Weinstein did a great job of uh, describing what social determinants of health are and why housing is so salient as a social determinant of health. Um, we, uh, my company has elevated homelessness as a philanthropic priority uh, for many reasons, moral imperative, but also uh, because it has such significant consequences for health. The average life expectancy for a person without stable housing is more than 27 years less than the average housed person. And I often cite this example, if you are uh, working with a patient and you want the patient to be medically compliant, medication compliant, it's very difficult to comply with your medications if you don't even have a medicine cabinet to keep them in. Without a place to live, it's nearly impossible for a person to take care of basic health needs. We know what the solution to homelessness is, it's housing. That doesn't make it simple and it certainly doesn't make it inexpensive, but we do know the solution. And in our region, uh, we have great pressure on housing prices and insufficient housing supply and significant issues of displacement and gentrification. There was um, a study at the University of Minnesota that showed that Washington DC had suffered the most widespread low income displacement in this century of any major central city in the United States. Next slide. And Washington DC is the epicenter of the homelessness catastrophe in our region. This chart um, averages the homelessness rate per 10,000 population to compare uh, several of the largest jurisdictions in our region and also Alameda County, California, which happens to be where Kaiser Permanente uh, is headquartered. And as you see here um, with a homelessness rate of more than 100 people out of 10,000 population experiencing homelessness in the District of Columbia, um, we have an absolute catastrophe in our nation's capital, which has ripple effects in the surrounding jurisdictions, although each jurisdiction has its own challenges. Next slide. So what I'm gonna do now is very briefly touch on a number of the philanthropic public health and community development priorities that my company has taken on in the region. I'll go through these um, fairly rapidly, uh, just to give you a picture of the interventions that we've embarked upon to address our extreme housing affordability squeeze and our homelessness uh, calamity. So in 2020, Kaiser Permanente in the mid-Atlantic states contributed $2.4 million uh, just last year to local governments and nonprofit service providers to address our region's homelessness catastrophe. Of this amount, more than $1 million was contributed in the District of Columbia, uh, which as I showed on the previous slide, has the region's worst incidence and prevalence of homelessness. 
Uh, our Mid-Atlantic region works closely with our national headquarters, we call that program office, and with Community Solutions, a national partner which promulgates evidence-based best practices to reduce the prevalence of homelessness, to identify grant opportunities that advance the goals of the Built for Zero campaign, a national effort to educate and assist uh, cities and counties to uh, take on their homelessness challenges. We also are very involved in an initiative called Accelerating Investments for Healthy Communities, which is a national effort sponsored by the Center for Community Investment that identifies hospitals and healthcare systems to serve as anchor institutions in their service areas to produce and preserve affordable housing. In our region, we've been concentrating on the Purple Line Corridor in Montgomery and Prince George's counties. We've done that because we've seen in our region and elsewhere that when a transit line is built, land values, rents, housing prices adjacent to the transit line frequently go up. And as in Washington, DC, uh, that can lead to displacement of longtime residents. Uh, Kaiser Permanente very much recognizes the benefits that the Purple Line will bring to communities along its route, and we're actively participating in efforts to ensure that residents who already live there will get those benefits and will not be displaced. Um, last year, Kaiser Permanente in the Mid-Atlantic States contributed $250,000 to um, produce and preserve affordable housing uh, along the Purple Line route, and the Center for Community Investment contributed 375,000. And this year, 2021, we are also proposing to support affordable housing projects in two additional uh, communities where we are concentrating our philanthropic and community development interventions in West Baltimore and in the Bailey's Culmore neighborhood in Fairfax County. Next slide. So um, I, I acknowledge up front that I'm speaking to Fairfax County housing advocates, and um, I'm proud that we have uh, invested in some interventions in Fairfax County, um, but the uh, to give you the whole picture of the work we're doing throughout the region, um, you will see that, that not all our interventions, of course, are in Fairfax County. Um, we are working with our national headquarters to implement medical legal partnerships into our care delivery so that we can refer patients who are experiencing housing instability uh, to legal services if they need it, um, if eviction is an issue or if there are other housing related legal issues uh, for our uh, uh, members who are facing um, housing challenges and who have um, very low incomes. We contributed $750,000 to the Community Partnership for Prevention of Homelessness in Washington, DC to convert grant per diem housing, which is um, a program under the US Department of Veterans Affairs to permanent housing. Um, Washington DC is a magnet for veterans experiencing homelessness in part because of this GPD program. These are temporary beds, they're transitional housing, uh, but it's better than sleeping on the street or in your car. But for that reason, veterans come to Washington DC to take advantage of this transitional housing and the city has made it a big priority to transition those beds to permanent supportive housing. And we've been supporting that. We contributed 75,000 to the Housing Initiative Partnership for counseling to prevent homelessness among Prince George's County residents uh, at risk of displacement. We're working with continuums of care throughout the Baltimore DC region to promote membership in our Mid-Atlantic Community Network. Just very briefly, uh, this is an online system that can refer people in need to service providers. Kaiser Permanente uses it to refer our Medicaid members and other members in need of services, but we also make it available for free at our cost to service providers who can use it to refer their clients to other service providers. We're very excited about the Digital Data Locker Initiative, which we uh, participated in funding with $150,000 to the Baltimore Mayor's Office of Homeless Services. This is an exciting new technology that provides free digital storage of vital documents for low-income and homeless service seekers who are in crisis. Um, those of you who work with the homeless, uh, with people experiencing homelessness know that just keeping track of documents is enormously difficult if you don't have a safe place to keep them. The digital data locker enables the upload of documents like a birth certificate, a social security card, and other vital documents to the cloud where they can be retrieved by the client, by a caseworker, or by a government agency. We contributed $250,000 to Washington, D.C. 
to pay for increased COVID-19 testing in shelters and connect those shelter residents who were placed in hotels and motels with permanent housing solutions. Kaiser Permanente will be sponsoring a regional forum on homelessness this spring to promote, promote collaboration between cities and counties in our region, including sharing of best practices. In Arlington County, we contributed $50,000 to ASPAN to support ASPAN's COVID-19 prevention response. Um, and then in uh, Washington, D.C. and Montgomery County for COVID-19 prevention and response, we made $125,000 in grant funding available. As I described earlier, we are carrying out our responsibilities under the Accelerating Investment for Healthy Communities initiative um, in the Purple Line Corridor and expanding our partnerships with housing practitioners in our Baltimore and Fairfax County place-based initiatives. And we're considering uh, today, actually, our national board is meeting today. The items in blue on my slides are those that are proposed, not yet finalized. The items in black are those grants that we already made last year. We're considering a $5 million Kaiser Permanente impact investment in a Purple Line Corridor revolving loan fund to be combined with funds from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase to create a total loan fund of $10 million that can be um, borrowed short term or long term uh, for pre-development expenses um, and other bridge expenses as uh, affordable housing practitioners put their funding stacks together in the Purple Line Corridor. Next slide, please. Uh, we contributed $375,000 to Community Solutions to be uh, spent in Fairfax County to provide case management and funds to individuals at risk of losing their housing and entering a shelter. We expect that these efforts will decrease the number of people who enter shelter from a non-homeless location by 30% by the end of this calendar year. We contributed $375,000 to Baltimore Mayor's Office of Homeless Services for a rapid rehousing flex fund to pay the expenses of moving in to permanent housing. We hope that this funding will result in 150 Baltimore residents exiting homelessness. We contributed $150,000 to Montgomery County, Maryland to support single adults on the verge of homelessness through case management and financial incentives to identify and secure housing. $150,000 to Cornerstone in Fairfax County to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on low and moderate income families in Fairfax County at risk of eviction and homelessness. Uh, again, our, we've worked very intensively in the Purple Line Corridor. Um, we've created and convened the Purple Line Corridor Coalition Housing Accelerator Team. It meets every other month. It convenes more than 50 community development experts, local government officials, for-profit and non-profit developers, bankers and lenders to serve as a catalyst to produce and preserve affordable housing in the corridor. Um, with our own funds, we contributed 200,000 for pre-development expenses at two preservation projects in Silver Spring and Tacoma Park and $50,000 um, in pre-development expenses, um, legal expenses and consulting fees at what is really sort of a flagship affordable housing project in the Purple Line Corridor. It's called Head and Spring. It's owned by the Refreshing Spring Church of God in Christ. As uh, all of you in the field know, um, we really look to uh, work with the religious institutions which have acreage in our heavily built up uh, Beltway adjacent communities. Um, religious institutions can often be the source of um, affordable housing projects. And the Head and Spring project in Riverdale, which is right next door, to an upcoming Purple Line station um, is a very exciting example that uh, we want to use as a best practice around the region of a religious institution devoting its land, um, constructing below market apartments, um, and also providing access to healthcare. And there's another example in Fairfax County, uh, which I'll speak to in a moment. Next slide, please. So um, proposed for this year, uh, we want to spend $100,000 in our local funds to support efforts at regional collaboration around homelessness. As I mentioned, we'll be convening a regional forum in the spring. Um, if you're interested in getting an invitation, you can email me and we'll make sure you're invited to our regional forum on homelessness. And we anticipate that at that forum, ideas for grant making will emerge and we're gonna to continue to work with Community Solutions, our national partner and local continuum of care to identify grant opportunities to reduce or eliminate homelessness in targeted subpopulations. Most of the communities uh, identify the veteran subpopulation first because it's 
um, a relatively smaller population than the larger population of people experiencing homelessness, and also because there are federal subsidies such as veterans assisted supportive housing uh, that are uniquely available for that um, for that population. And then uh, to increase affordable housing supply, I've already discussed the work we're doing in the Purple Line Corridor. We're proposing additional grants in 2021. Um, I'm very proud of uh, being able to expand our affordable housing efforts to West Baltimore. We want to pr provide funds for a uh, mission-oriented developer from the neighborhood who will be purchasing vacant homes in West Baltimore. Those of you who know the neighborhood know that there's a tremendous problem with blight and vacant homes, renovate them and sell them to neighborhood residents at deeply affordable prices. And then Wesley Housing, who's probably, uh, I think is one of the speakers on this panel and uh, involved in this conference, uh, we propose to contribute $70,000 for our ongoing support of the First Christian Church Project in um, Bailey's Crossroads, which will provide 113 affordable senior apartments on seven acres owned by the First Christian Church. So you see a pattern here of the kind of project that make us excited and where um, we're able to uh, devote a small amount of resources, which we hope leverage additional capital. Let me just close by saying that um, we hope that other large employers will work with us, even if we're in the same business, healthcare systems, health insurance companies, we wanna partner uh, with other private sector and nonprofit sector partners. But no matter what we do, it pales in comparison to the need. And there is a great need for federal, state and local government intervention. Just to close, I was very proud to be able to contribute $1 million in my company's resources to the District of Columbia to address its homelessness catastrophe. But we're hoping that Mayor Bowser will include $96 million in her 2022 budget um, just for chronic homelessness. So you can see the scope of the problem is so enormous that all of the help and assistance that the philanthropic community can provide, which again, I'm very proud of the resources that I've detailed here, um, is really a very small amount in comparison to the size of the need and the urgency of intervention at the federal, state, and local government level. And thank you for the opportunity to present. Yes, thank you. And it's, it's amazing how much uh, Kaiser has going on. So thank you for giving us an idea. And I know they have more. So hopefully in the question and answer period, we'll, we'll get to hear more about a lot of those um, um, projects that you've been talking about. Um, so it's my pleasure next to get to introduce um, Jillian Copeland. She has extensive experience in a variety of settings. Um, she founded the Diener School and has served in many capacities there, including as an educator, staff trainer, technology coordinator, head of school and board of trustee chair and member. In addition, she's a member of the board of directors for the Jewish Foundation for Group Homes, the National Arc, and she serves on the MIH Montgomery Housing Committee and the University of Maryland's Transition Hub. Her tireless efforts have been recognized in a wide variety of ways, including the Community Leadership Award from the Jewish Women International, the A. Poland Humanitarian Award from the Bender JCC, and the Bullis School Community Leadership Award, and the Trailblazer Award from the Vis Arts Community, just to mention a few. I, I, I didn't mention them all, Jillian, sorry. Um, but I think what we're going to really be excited to hear about today is her latest endeavor, which is called Main Street, which is an inclusive and affordable apartment building and community center serving people of all abilities. Main Street opened doors to residents in the summer of 2020 and currently provides membership opportunities to over 200 residents and non-resident members. Uh, Jillian, welcome, and I'm excited to hear more about Main Street. Thank you, Allie. Um, thank you to everybody. I'm assuming, can you all hear me? Everybody? Hard to see. I don't see anybody, but... Um, yes, we can to... hear you. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I am honored to be on this group of panelists with George and Denise, and thank you, Allie, for, for moderating, facilitating, and... Um, so welcome to Main Street. Um, you can change the slide. I'm gonna, you, you know a lot about me. I, I wouldn't have said all the, the awards or anything, but, um, but I, I'm Jillian and I am the founder of Main Street Connect. And I'm gonna tell, share a little bit about Main Street. I'm gonna go rather quickly because I think that um, more time for your questions would be probably helpful for all of you. Um, so Main Street is um, a community and we are a membership model. Um, right now, we are um, providing virtual membership because we are not able to provide physical membership, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but we're getting there. We're planning to open up in the next month or two, depending on what the county allows us to do. 
Um, we are um, an inclusive apartment building in Rockville, Maryland. We hope to um, have many, many more apartment buildings around main streets or uh, in the USA and maybe beyond too. Um, but right now we're located in Rockville Town Center. And what makes us really unique? Um, well, I think a lot of things make us unique, but that um, we have 25% had set aside 25% of our units um, for adults with special needs. Um, 70, we are a 70 unit building, as you can see, and 75% of all of our um, units are affordable. Um, you can see at the bottom here, our mission is to create dynamic opportunities through inclusive housing mm -hmm. and community engagement so people of all abilities can live their best lives. And that's really what we're doing in a variety of ways. So we're providing the housing in our inclusive, accessible, affordable apartment building. Um, the ground floor is a community center. Um, that, again, that community piece is really big for us. We offer this community center with a, um, it has several different spaces, including a demo kitchen, a, and it's a beautiful, highly amenitized building, um, a demo kitchen, a movie room, um, a great big patio with a grill and a, and, um, a garden and a classroom and a yoga room, peace room and um, a full fitness center. We have a coffee shop called Soulful Cafe that's in the front um, and that, that hopefully engages pedestrians when they start walking up and down the street again. Um, and really the, the idea behind Main Street is that we have this, this apartment building we're providing spaces for people to live affordably we had this community center wraparound because we believe that that is, is so critically important. Um, it's one thing for people to be able to ha live independently, but what we're finding with the population of people with disabilities is they're living independently, but they're still not living full, meaningful quality lives. Um, so providing this community wraparound is really critical uh, to the success of people um, enjoying their lives and finding meaning and passion and purpose. Um, and I'll get into that, that health component um, next. So you can, um, if you please would change the slide, that would be great. Um, I was asked to provide a little bit about lessons learned. And even though I'm not gonna go into the, a lot of the financial stack or the hurdles that we had day to day building Main Street, those of you in the real estate um, uh, business, especially in affordable uh, know how difficult it can be to structure the deal, right? So as George said, they help others um, and provide leverage and do amazing things, George, um, with, um, with Thrive and um, through, and, and many organizations help, but it's really hard to kind of lay out that financial capital and that stack and, and just have, have all the stakeholders invested. And we were really lucky because we were able to receive 9% low income housing tax credits um, we, were, we were able to get investment from our county, from people like George and the county council and our, our county executive, and that was really critically important. We were able to get loans from, from people who really understood our mission. Um, the, the, so, so, so the building roadblocks, I think many of you probably already know, and if you have questions about that, we can go into some of that later, um, or you can feel free to email me. Um, education, I think, is, is really one of the, the roadblocks for us because even when we bring people to Main Street and we talk about the mission of inclusivity and why it's important that people with disabilities are provided opportunities with housing, with health, with um, that people walk away and they say, wow, that's really cool. That's a building for people with disabilities. It's not. It's an apartment building. It's inclusive, accessible, and affordable. And it's an apartment building for everyone. We just naturally and, and, and thoughtfully include people of all abilities. And so I think that education is, is trying to, is difficult because this, these preconceived notions of, of siloed programs and siloed housing for people with disabilities is really what we're trying to change is that, and it's really a, mind, um, a mindset change and a culture shift and, and that takes time, but that definitely is a roadblock for us and something that we are learning along the way and trying to find better ways to communicate um, and to spread our message near and far. Lessons learned, kindness really matters. Um, even providing platforms, we have 20 virtual programs a week that we run, providing platforms for people to share, for people to have a safe space, to be who they are, to not find judgment on the other end. Um, it really matters. We have been a lifeline and anchor for people during COVID, including myself. I come on the line to do Zumba and yoga and um, a space of belonging, which is a, a therapeutic support group that we offer. And we do community walks and, you know, kindness makes a difference. Um, we found always better to partner. 
Um, we have several um, collaborative partners in our area, thought partners around the country and locally that have been critically important to our success. We are working with the University of Maryland right now to conduct a research project on the quality of life satisfaction for residents who have moved into Main Street with disabilities, residents who have moved into Main Street without disabilities, and family members of residents with disabilities. And how does that look? And we, we wanted it to be an IRB review uh, approved um, research study. So partnering with the University of Maryland was just was so important for us and, and we'll have those results in the next couple months, which will be great. And I think most importantly, our lesson right now, especially during COVID and the, the rates of, of people with mental health disorders and, and um, disconnections and loneliness and isolation is just, is just mind boggling and the numbers are staggering. And I think what Main Street does and what's so important for everyone is to have a place to belong. Um, and so, yeah, that, I think that's, probably the, the biggest lesson that we have learned. Um, so if you please um, change the slide, that would be great. And that brings me to health. And part of why we're here today in this, this incredible um, synergy between health and housing is, is obviously really important. Um, if, you, if you aren't comfortable um, financially, if you aren't able to pay your rent, if you are homeless, if you don't have opportunities for safe housing, um, you know, health isn't even going to be a factor, right? And so now that we have um, 31 of our units actually are comprised of people with disabilities at Main Street, so almost half, and we have people moving in, but now we're really concerned about what their health looks like. We've provided them with housing. A lot of our other members um, who don't live at Main Street, but we still have 115 other members who do not live at Main Street, you can still come to our community center and access all of our physical and virtual programs. But overall, and, and many of them do live independently, but what we're finding overall is health is a huge concern. Um, and, and people, many people with disabilities, what we're finding is um, there isn't preventative health. There aren't a lot of opportunities in healthcare for them. Um, and the, the healthcare opportunities that are out there are hard to access, hard to understand, hard to get to. Uh, and so we are creating, we've created this Live Well program with the, which is in this intensive wellness initiative. Um, and we have personal wellness coaches that will be helping working with small cohorts of people to create goals and help them even with executive functioning their schedules so that they can actually see what programs that we offer virtually and physically. Um, and we have programs on wellness, we have workouts, we have health seminars and workshops. We've collaborated with the people that you see below, the partners, Holy Cross, Suburban Hospital and Jessa, so that we have mental, our goals are really physical and mental health and how do we improve the health of our participants in this um, Live Well pilot project. And we really, we really understand that, that, social, that, that health is a, is a social determinant. Social determinants are of health also. I don't know if I said that right, but I think you know what I'm saying. So, um, so health is, is a big component for us. And now that we have people living affordably, comfortably, feeling dignified and respected living in a place of beauty that has light and makes them feel worthy. Now it's time to focus on health because that is such an important determinant overall of their quality of life satisfaction. Um, so we can go to the last slide with I, I think is just contact information. Um, this is our beautiful inclusive community. These are some people that are really involved. And um, George, I know you're not in this picture, but one of these pictures, but you were with us that day for our groundbreaking in 2018. So always grateful for, for your support. And if you want to contact me, my email is there. Our website is there. Please, please um, pass our information along to friends and family who just might have have people with disabilities might not, might know people, might just want a place to belong, right? All ages and stages and people, everybody, no matter your background, your socioeconomic level, everybody needs a place to be them, to do you. And so um, I believe that we are that place. So thank you so very much for including me. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys on the panel in a few minutes. Great, thank you so much. I mean, such an amazing, exciting program. So I'm sure we're gonna have even more questions about it as we get to the panelist side. And I really appreciate your mentioning mental health um, because we know that there's just uh, that, when we say, when I say health, I'm a psychologist. So I sort of assume we're talking about mental and physical, but I appreciate the idea that it needs to be really a, a focus area. So now I, I get to um, introduce 
our, um, our last panelist, um, Denise Chadwick Wright. Um, and Denise holds a Master's of Business Administration with a concentration in Health Administration from Eastern University and a BS in B Business Administration from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. She's a dedicated advocate for senior members and communities to have access to quality care that respects and protects personal dignity. Denise has been recognized by her peers in various ways, including the prestigious American College of Healthcare Administrators Facility Leadership Award in recognition of organizational leadership. And most recently, Denise was named as a 2021 McKnight's Woman of Distinction Award winner in the Hall of Honor category. She is one of only 19 senior level women working in senior living or skilled nursing to be recognized in 2021. Currently, she is the CEO of Birmingham Green, a community with a holistic approach of fostering the spirit, nurturing the body, and nourishing the mind. Birmingham Green provides individualized care and services for adults with specific physical and medical needs in one of three service settings, the Northern Virginia Healthcare Center, or one of the two assisted living facilities, Willow Oaks and District Home. Uh, Denise, welcome, and we're excited to hear from you. Thank you, Allie. I'm delighted to take part in today's panel because Birmingham Green is a living, working example of the phrase, it takes a village. Community and partnerships are what we do, and it's the life and blood that allows us to do what we do. It will be 96 years this coming year when five Northern Virginia local governments join together to ensure that those with minimal means, primarily the elderly, those disabled and of low income could come together to live in a safe and caring environment to thrive. Our vision today continues to be a Northern Virginia regional partner since 1927. We believe in the dignity for every person. Birmingham Green has evolved as a cooperative venture of the counties of Fairfax, Fauquier, Loudoun, Prince William, and the city of Alexandria, located on a 54 acre campus in Prince William County. We are the home and safety net for residents of these local localities with 350 team members who provide services to a range of 250 to 300 residents a day across our campus. Birmingham Green is a place where heroes live and heroes work. Next slide, please. Our campus consists of three buildings as shared, the District Home Assistant Living, which was the original building, opened in 1927 as an affordable private pay assistant living facility. And we have 36 comfortable private and shared units in a dormitory style building. Underneath this photo, we have our Northern Virginia Health Center Commission, which was built in 1991. It's a 180-bed duly certified Medicare and Medicaid licensed nursing facility where we offer both short-term rehabilitation as well as long-term care services. And we also have in this building a designated 60-bed memory impairment neighborhood. Next slide, please. In Willow Oaks, um, this is our newest building. It's a 92-unit HUD supportive housing building built in 2007. It's comprised of both studio and one-bedroom unit apartments. The building had a recent refresh with painting and new flooring throughout the corridors. It has 77 apartments for those 62 and older and 15 apartments for those under the age of 62 with disabilities. The resident payer source for this building is 100% auxiliary grant funded, um, a state um, program. I would now like to share with you inside the doors of our community and how we fulfill our mission as a community with a holistic approach, fostering the spirit, nurturing the body and nourishing the mind. Living the Birmingham Green Way through our values. We have three values that I'd like to speak to. Next slide, please. Our first value is stewardship. We have here Virginia who has served with us for 40 plus years she works in our nursing home and the nursing department. She's a mentor and a leader to our nursing staff. And we also have David. David is a social worker at Willow Oaks. And he 
has taken on deli walks with one of our residents who used to be able to walk independently to Starbucks. Well, that changed and, De and David stepped in. And so for this, we partner with the Seeker Foundation, which is a caregiving peer-to-peer -peer recognition group. They promote that. And David received an award based off nominations submitted by both staff as well as residents and family members. Inclusiveness is our second value. And that's and through our partnerships with the Eden Alternative Program, whose philosophy is living life every day to the fullest degree possible and taking away the BLAS, BLAS being B-L-A-H-S, an acronym, boredom, loneliness, and helplessness. An example of this has been accomplished in our nursing home. We have a resident empowerment committee and here they've taken on fundraising drives for local causes as well as assisting with funding for disasters um, in other areas. So um, encouraging their level of independence while here. We also have a partnership with Westminster Canterbury on the Bay and their Birdsong Initiative. The Birdsong Initiative personalizes ways to use tablets promoting resident engagement and connectedness while enhancing and maintaining cognitive skills and promoting um, the resident engagement. So amazingly, the research done for the Birdsong Initiative shows that outcomes conducted for this initiative, the participants have shown that over half of the residents have had a decrease in depression. And 20% of the caregivers, they had a decrease in caregiver stress. Also, it showed increases in cognition was experienced by about 10% of the population. And um, there was also a decrease in blood pressure by about 8%. Finally, our third value is passion. And through multi-generational partnership programs such as Lyrics Garden, which is a pop-up garden inspired by Lyric, an elementary school student who had a goal to feed the homeless and to um, feed the, pe the people um, in need of food in the community. So one of her gardens is located here on our campus. We also have partnerships with local universities, such as George Mason, the Department of Social Work, as well as our local schools, elementary um, schools with artwork, as well as local high schools. And we had a recent um, volunteer, Stephen, who's a high school student, as well as an Eagle Scout, who based off his past time spent with his grandfather, he built a bocce court at Willow Oaks, which is loved by the residents there. The Birmingham Green Campus is a human habitat. We have greenery, we have wildlife visits with deer, cats, geese, and we have our own house pets. We have Vincent, um, our dog, and we have two rabbits, Bentley and Tika. In each building, we have bird aviaries um, for the residents to enjoy, and some residents do participate in um, feeding the birds and caring for them. Um, and on our campus, um, we have people with um, various levels of needs and various um, diagnoses, um, including behavioral health, mental health services. In closing, the mindset that helps us bring our values to work every day is our belief that our workplace is another's home space. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and I'm just going to take a second before we get to the Q&A to just say what an honor it is to be able to share this space with um, all of our panelists. So um, now I'm excited to sort of move to our question and answer um, period um, where we'll, we'll have um, all of the panelists available um, for questions. We've had some come in already. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the, the Q&A. So the first one I want to get started with is, um, is about aging in place. So we, we know that research has shown that there are positive impacts for adults being able to age in place, but it's often more um, because it allows, it can be more cost effective. It can let individuals stay better connected to their networks and often have better health outcomes. But it's not always um, it's not always possible to have the ability to age in place, um, particularly because of complex 
um, and numerous housing challenges. So how can we engage aging services stakeholders in conversations around housing? And how do we provide opportunities for all adults to age in place if they want to? Well, um, I'll share um, Birmingham Green is a perfect example of aging in place. So some people, um, they if they don't have a home or perhaps based off of how their home is built, it may not be feasible for them to stay in their home and age in place. But across our campus, when we look at residents, we have various age residents, but we've had residents that have been here for multiple years and able to age and be independent um, here on our campus, which is the philosophy that we have adopted utilizing the Eden alternative. I know there's research to support that allowing people to be um, social if they choose to be social around others, making sure they're getting their nutrition with their foods, as well as being involved and active is very important for them. And with the counties that we're partnered with, their support, they support us financially. We're in their budgets. And so doing that allows us to provide the services here on our campus. I mean, our strategic plan, we're working on feasibility studies now, but we are looking at how we can expand our campus because there is a need for more affordable housing. So that's something that we're working on. Yeah, I'd like to comment. Um, Kaiser Permanente, of course, is a large Medicare provider. We have a very uh, substantial population of um, older, uh, mature residents and I would say that the pandemic has actually offered a lot of frontiers of opportunity uh, for folks who may be homebound to participate in activities, cultural activities, um, fitness, health activities. We uh, have a program called Thriving After 65, which uh, used to gather um, uh, Medicare participants in a single location to do fitness and exercise classes. And what we found now that um, they're doing it remotely and distributed is that participation is even higher um, and that's true, I think, for a lot of civic and cultural activities. I'm on the Kennedy Center's email list, for example, and I might not buy a ticket to go to the Kennedy Center. It might not fit with my schedule. It's inconvenient. you got to pay for parking. But I might watch a concert at home in my living room that otherwise I would not have. So I do actually think that the distributed nature of um, you know, utilizing uh, telehealth services, video conferencing, and making health, fitness, cultural, political, community activities available um, has opened up a whole new frontier uh, in the current time frame that I think make, um, you know, elderly folks and those who have limited mobility uh, give them access to a whole range of activities that they were not before. I'm not minimizing the challenge of, you know, paying property tax, uh, uh, maintaining your housing. Uh, one of the big conversations that's taking place in local governments around our region is allowing accessory apartments and um, allowing uh, more folks to make use of the housing stock that does exist. One of the big benefits of accessory apartments is that um, if you are aging in place and staying in your home, you might be able to generate some income from some of the bedrooms that um, have been vacated or the acreage uh, in your yard or, um, you know, in, in use part of your home in a way that you might not have before to enable you to continue living there and also generate income and provide affordable housing for other people. Thank you. Uh, Jillian, I wasn't sure if you maybe wanted, I'm putting you on the spot, sorry, but I didn't know why, maybe if you wanted to comment on sort of uh, on your housing and, and how did you think about sort of the aging in place nature as your residents start to age? Actually, um, thank you for that. Yes, um, we, we, we did. We, a, lot, a lot of people came to us, especially people um, who were helping us design the building. Um, so we really looked at, you know, not just ADA compliance, because clearly, you know, everybody follows that in it. Quite honestly, most people with disabilities would tell you that the ADA compliance doesn't mean that much to them because they need a lot more. So we not only looked at, we interviewed people of all ages and stages. We interviewed people with all different cross disability. So people with visual impairments, hearing impairments, um, mobility challenges, people with autism. Um, and we really tried to, to um, look at senior housing and look at their universal design and what were their best practices um, in terms of design, and we, I think we added every single element um, into Main Street that that needed to happen. So, for an ex for example, um, when people have vis vision challenges, 
Um, you might have braille on your elevator, right? On your floors and on your elevator. And so they get on the elevator and they know which button to press, but they don't know if other people are in the elevator. And if other people press buttons, they don't know where to stop. They, when the elevator stops, they don't know what floor it's on. If they're going to sixth floor and it stops at the second, they're not sure. So, you know, we have an audible in the elevator now that says floor two, floor three. Um, so, you know, various kinds of elements that we added in and we hope those will be great for people that are aging in place. And we do have some people who are older that are living in the building. So I haven't surveyed them quite yet. haven't had time for that, but I absolutely will. Um, I, and like George was saying, um, the accessory units also in people's homes, it, it provides opportunity for caregivers to live there as well. Um, and so, so that's a really good opportunity. And I have one um, in the house behind me. The person is creating their accessory unit now. And I think that's a really wonderful thing because people can age in place. Um, the disability population, what people think often is that especially parents who are looking for places for their, for their kids to live, which is clearly is very difficult because the barriers are a lack of affordability and, and accessibility. And when they find some place, what they oftentimes don't realize, and I'm kind of in this boat too, but people who are older than me have taught me this, is that people with disabilities are just like all of us. They typically don't want to live in one space for the rest of their life. So we all need to think about where they're going to move next because they want to move around just like we do. Um, so aging in place is something we all need to be thinking about for whatever population we're working with. Yeah, thank you. And I think it, just like what you're saying, it, it needs to be thought of when things are being built, not after things are built and then trying to retrofit. So I think that sort of the planning is what is what I'm taking away is really important here. Um, so we had some a couple questions pop in. I'm going to jump around a little bit for the people in the background. Um, but uh, one of the questions I think is really interesting. So um, they, they make sure that they comment that you guys have wonderful organizations, which I agree. And so uh, what do these wonderful organizations do for outreach to find people who need help, but are reluctant to seek it because of potentially depression or embarrassment or simply lack of knowledge that these kinds of helps exist? So how, how do we do the outreach side of it? Well, from the standpoint of Kaiser Permanente, care coordination is a big priority um, and the total health approach means that for each Kaiser Permanente member, there's an extensive medical record, including social needs. And so where uh, a patient is in contact with their Kaiser Permanente provider, and in the course of an interview, um, it, uh, we find out, for example, that um, that member is food insecure uh, through the Mid-Atlantic Community Network, which I mentioned earlier, our care coordination team can identify a food pantry that that Kaiser Permanente member can make use of. Uh, so where there are social needs, we're trying to provide an integrated approach where we can connect our members with needs beyond just um, you know, doctor, nurse, pharmacy, uh, but also try to identify the whole person's needs. And, and so um, that does require that the member be in contact with the provider. Obviously, there are a lot of people who, who go without care for a period of time, but uh, Kaiser Permanente takes a, a, a very active approach to uh, making sure that follow-up appointments are made, that there are regular checkups. So if you're a Kaiser Permanente member, um, it, you know, it's a whole health approach and it's a very active approach. Yes, please go ahead, Denise. Um, at Birmingham Green, working with the five local um, localities, we work with the case managers there. We have liaisons. And so as they're out in the community visiting with um, various residents and identifying needs, then they um, communicate with us and we have a, a wait list for our assistant living building. Also, we um, participate in community events on a regular basis to try to keep um, information about the services we provide uh, out there um, so that people can um, contact us. And pre-COVID, um, although we're looking at visitation soon limited um, outside, but we had a very large volunteer um, group in the community um, with different affiliations with the local organizations, churches. And so sometimes word of mouth um, has been a great resource for referrals. In education. So. 
Do you want that? To me? Please, Jillian. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. So outreach um, is definitely something on our mind all the time. Um, it's kind of like, you know who you know, and you think everybody knows that what, what's going on. So we've, we've spent a lot of time on outreach. 20% of people that live in Montgomery County are of Latinx um, uh, culture. And um, we are trying to reach out to that community. In fact, our, our Live Well initiative, um, we actually have one of our personal wellness coaches that is bilingual and speaks Spanish. And we're hoping that um, we understand also the, the cultural competencies that go along with that. So we're, we're partnering with Identity, um, which is a nonprofit in, um, that works with a, a, lot, a lot of vulnerable communities, but um, in particular, the Latinx community. We've, we're trying to reach out to Catholic charities and faith-based communities to let them know that we're here and that you know we are a, an inclusive um, programming membership, um, a, pl a place for everybody to belong. And we want you know anyone who is a part of their um, a membership or a part of their faith to join us. Um, we've partnered with a, so many local people, and I think that really helps with outreach. So partnering with Holy Cross and Suburban Hospital, and we've partnered with the Montgomery County Collaboration Council and Easter Seals and lots of different organizations to provide education. Um, to provide opportunities. We've been doing a lot of universal design training on Zoom and for physical um, engagement as well for people with disabilities because we're finding that the medical industry and other industries are really interested in universal design and how can they outreach to our community. So it's kind of like this cross collaboration, which is super fun. Um, and even with health, you know, partnering with, um, with Holy Cross and, and different um, health and even local dentists that we've been finding to, to, to work with them to say, hey, we can help you and you can help our membership too. come provide health screenings for us, you know, provide that mobile opportunity for lots of our people. Transportation is a real barrier. Um, the transportation in our county for people with disabilities is not good and not accessible and not easy. And so if you can bring some health opportunities to our people, um, we can get them here to do that. So even Rockville City, working with the city on local events and Chamber of Commerce. So, so really trying to outreach to lots of different opportunities so that we, we hit personal, we hit family, we hit professionals mm -hmm. um, and from all different faiths and, and backgrounds and socioeconomic levels. Um, that's really important to us. And if anybody has ideas, um, please, we would be very interested for suggestions. Great, thank you. Um, so I've got a couple questions for, for individuals, but I want to stay, which I'm going to get to in a, in a second, but I, I want to ask a question that's still aimed at all of you, because I think it's, it hits on some of the other questions, which is everyone's really excited about what um, the three organizations are doing, and they want to know how we do more of it, right? How do we bring it to more localities? But I think part of that, uh, it, this question really gets at the heart of that. So what key policies do states and local jurisdictions need to have in place to allow for more development? that each of your organizations have, have demonstrated here? Are, are there things that the state and localities really need to, to be aware of? And remember, we have some of these people hopefully joining us today that would help um, facilitate the expansion of these programs. I, I guess I, I, I'm a former local government official. I would say that um, it's very important that cities and counties in our region maintain housing production trust funds that are flexibly available so that when a deal uh, gets put together, like uh, the Main Street project that Jillian put together in Rockville, um, local government is able to step up and assist in the financing stack. Most of these projects are gonna be funded through low-income housing tax credits, but that's not going to provide 100% of the financing that's necessary. And you know it's incredibly difficult to um, to arrange the financing stack. So if you have local government backing from the start, uh, it won't provide you with 100% of the funds that you need, but it, it helps to get you there and it also helps validate your application for the low-income housing tax credits. So um, Fairfax has, Montgomery has, the District of Columbia has, um, Arlington has, uh, other jurisdictions in our region uh, need to adopt uh, uh, housing trust funds and um, invest as much as they possibly can, make them as robust as possible. And thank you. And I'm just going to show my ignorance for one second. So housing trust funds, can you just describe that just a little bit more for those who might not be familiar? Four words, a pot of money. That I can understand. So thank <laughs> you. Um, 
Jillian or, or Denise, do you want to weigh in on sort of state and local jurisdiction policies that might be helpful? Uh, Jillian, I see that you're off mute. I, I, I totally agree with George, and George knows this so well. Um, and I, I guess the, the other thing that I would add is, um, and the, the money is huge and the understanding with the need. I mean, look, affordable housing is a crisis around the globe. It's, a, it's not just here. Um, and when you throw disability in there, it's, you know, more complicated. Um, I think for us, as George said, I mean, first of all, the, the low income housing tax credits, especially the 9% are so competitive now that they're really hard to get, right? We were so lucky to get them. The 4%, are, you know, might not give you enough capital to, to make the deal work. Um, for us, it was getting that first person in the pool, like the first foot in the pool. Once we got that in, we had some leverage, like George said, to go to some of these other um, state and local um, organizations. And, and so I think that the other piece is that some of our money came from different places and some of them have competing policies or conflicting policies also. Um, so that, that I would say if, if local state and federal monies um, not only were available, but also the policies were similar um, and the restrictions and the criteria were similar, that would be really helpful because we found we would get money from here and they wanted us to do a certain number that were certain number of units that were um, set aside for disability. And then we go to somebody else to get money and they needed a different number. And that was very difficult. So um, that was, that's a challenge. I would just add, you know, I agree with both Jillian and George, the financial piece is so important. In addition to that, I think um, also when the developers, like we see developments all the time. I live in Fairfax County um, in Alexandria and it's developments going up um, constantly. And so if there is a way for there to be um, some type of collaboration with the developers to assist with affordable um, new developments for um, affordable housing and people in need of services, I think is key. And also um, I've been reading about a program in Pennsylvania, um, I believe it's Clearfield County, it's called the Village of Hope. And there um, they identify um, land where the aging, um, the aging commission there um, have developed housing for people, um, inclusiveness to age in place. It also includes affordable housing for um, people that work in the community. So um, there's different concepts of, out there that I think we could take from other areas. Great, thank you. So uh, Denise, I'm gonna continue with you since you were just talking and, and this was directly um, um, directly directed at you. Um, how, how would we, how do we expand the Birmingham green model into more localities, right? You said you have a waiting list. So uh, how, how do you think that that could happen potentially? communication collaboration um, with the different counties that are interested in um, development of this type of model is something that can be done uh, where um, we're open to sharing information with people that have interest in um, a similar model I think um, you know so I hope I answered the question Yes, I agree. It's, it's hard to think about expansion uh, when resources are tight. Um, but Jillian, you got a very similar question. So someone asked, is there a pilot somewhere operating in Fairfax that resembles the model that um, you've talked about? And if not, they want to know, how would we get one started? How did, how did that beginning sort of seeds of ideas happen? That's a great question. Um, I did see that in there. Um, well, there is an organization called City Center Nova. So if you're not familiar with them, I would definitely get in touch. We've been working with them a little bit lately, but um, more to in their in their inception. Um, and um, there, we do not have a, a pilot program or, or um, a program that we're expanding quite yet. We're waiting really to understand what the data looks like. I mean, I can tell you from from a qualitative point of view that. Already, even in COVID, people living independently at Main Street, being there has changed their lives. And I think for the better. But I need the metrics for that in order to share with other people. Um, and hopefully once we get that in the next few months, we can expand and outreach a little bit. And I would love to be in Northern Virginia. There are, we have many members from Northern Virginia who are joining us. We have members actually from nine different states who are, are members. 
Um, so get in touch with me. Um, I can help you. I think that's a, a, a bigger conversation, but I think finding like that group of people that um, share the interests that you you share in the kind of housing project that you want, it could be supportive housing, lit, inclusive housing, lots of different opportunities. Um, and then once you guys have a group together and you're all with a common understanding, this is what we wanna do, um, there are other groups out there. And I have a database of people all around the country who are trying to build um, housing, pro housing models, all different types. Um, for all different kinds of people um, with disabilities. And so if you are interested, just get in touch with me. Um, but I guess, you know, find your group. Um, and then once you find your group, you guys find your groove. And then I'm happy to, you know, um, assist you in any way I can. Thank you. And Georgia, I wanted to follow up with one of the questions that was more directed towards you because you mentioned how sort of healthcare systems and large employers in the area really need to contribute funding to housing just as Kaiser has really um, done. How do you, is there a way you see we can accelerate these partnerships from uh, accelerating the partnerships to happen? Uh, I think what you're doing here today in Fairfax County is a good example of the kind of call to action uh, that the county can issue to its large companies and large employers. I, I think um, local government officials need to uh, be clear with large employers that there's an expectation that they participate in civic life. And part of that is, is addressing the affordable housing crunch that faces those own companies' workforce. I mean, we um, th there's many reasons having to do with social determinants of health, but it's also in the self-interest of a large healthcare system uh, because, um, you know, some of our employees are highly compensated, many are not. If you work in the pharmacy, if you work in, if you're a medical tech, if you work in building maintenance, if you work in IT systems, you know, a lot of folks are facing the housing crunch uh, whose incomes are not that high. And so it's, it's very much in our own interest to increase housing supply. Uh, and that's true of any large employer. So, but the county has to take the lead. There's, there's no substitute for local government leadership on this front, local government, uh, has got to be able to invest the funds. Local government has got to address the zoning and land use issues, the permitting issues to facilitate more housing supply. And as we're doing right here today, um, local government can issue the call to action uh, to the corporate sector, the nonprofit sector, the philanthropic sector, um, and show leadership where you're in a community like Fairfax, which has taken a very proactive approach through legislation and through its budget, um, it, you know, it, it sends a signal that this is a commitment of local government. And if, the, and if you're a uh, an employer or a company located in Fairfax County, um, you know, get on board. The expectation is, is that you'll participate. Thank you. And, you know, I think your sentiments were, were echoed almost exactly from an er the earlier session that we heard um, with some of our, our county representatives and uh, the president of George Mason um, and um, Dr. Brabant from the Board of Education, right? That this is, when we talk about sort of affordable housing, sometimes the vision that people have is for individuals who may not be employed or those sorts of things. But in this area, we have people who have very important jobs who still can't afford housing, right? So, so understanding that and wrapping that into the full picture is really important. Um, also, I wanted to make one clarification. Uh, Jillian mentioned City Center Nova um, as a, a potential example. They, did, they changed their name to uh, our uh, stomping grounds. Um, oh. So just in case people were trying to Google them, it's our stomping ground now. Um, Allie, can, um, I so I have time? can I have one more Please. quick thing? I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so happy to know that. So thank you for sharing. I will note that. Um, and the other thing is we do have a how to create your own Main Street, a webinar on our um, website. Um, and so it does kind of walk you through the steps of how we did this. So I forgot to mention that. So if you're looking, it is on our website. Great, thank you. I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, so, um, and we don't have a ton of time, so I'm gonna take a little bit more straightforward question. Um, this is really about sort of, I think, accessibility a bit. Um, so the question revolves around sort of definitions. So there's, there's apartments set aside for individuals with disabilities. How do you qualify to be in those, those housing communities? Um, if someone has something like diabetes or a visual impairment or, or Asperger's, but they don't have disability payments, right? They were turned down for those benefits. Are they able to access these things or do you sort of have to go with sort of governmental, um, um, you know, stamps of approval in terms of definitions? I'm sorry, am I unmuted? Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay, 
Thanks. Um, I, I just have a quick answer, at least from the Main Street perspective. Um, it oftentimes depends on where you get your funding, um, what that term means. So for Main Street, um, ours, um, because most of our money came from low-income housing tax credits for us, um, special needs is very broad. And there are housing developments that people have created with set-asides for people with autism or people with mobility challenges or you know, for specific, a specific bucket or category of disability. For us, it's cross-disability. And as long as we understand that you have a disability, and that could be from even just a doctor's note, um, then you are qualified to leave in the Main Street Apartments. I think it's different um, dependent on where you're, you're receiving your funding. Yes, and for Birmingham Green at our Willow Oaks location, um, that's a HUD funded building. So for the under the age of 62 with disabilities, we have to follow the HUD requirements, section 202. But we also, um, because it's assistant living building, we provide services uh, if the residents are in need of assistant living services, there's an assessment that's conducted, um, completed based off um, questions that are asked to the individual and the physician signs off on it um, regarding disabilities. And that would be the assessment is across the board. All right, thank you. So unfortunately, I think we are just about out of time but I really get to express my gratitude um, for our panelists for taking time out of their very busy and important schedules to come here. I know that I learned a lot, um, so I'm sure that our audience did as well. So really, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Um, it's truly appreciated. Um, and so I, I guess I get to turn this back over to Ben. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Weinstein. And thank you to our excellent panelists for such an insightful discussion. Um, we'd also like to thank our attendees for the excellent questions that have come in. Uh, if we were unable to get to your question, please feel free to email them to us at rha at fairfaxcounty.gov. Uh, we received the question and would like to just make sure that everyone knows that the information that's been shared in the presentation and the recordings of these sessions will be made online and we'll be sure to send those links to all of our attendees and participants once uh, that material has been posted. As with our previous session, uh, you will soon see a link in the chat uh, to this session's feedback survey, as well as to the unique link for our session scheduled to begin at 1.30. That session is titled Affordable Housing, Making the Grade for Educational Success. Uh, the link is also available in your program and in the email you received this morning through Eventbrite. Uh, as you complete your survey and head to lunch, uh, we'll close out this session with some previously recorded message, messages from our sponsors. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us. Enjoy your lunch and we'll see you in session three at 1.30 p.m. Hi, I'm Ryan McLaughlin, CEO of the Northern Virginia Association of Realtors. Our organization represents over 12,000 real estate professionals in the Northern Virginia and Metro DC region. Housing the residents of the community is what our realtor members do. Our members devote themselves to helping people make Northern Virginia their home. We understand that secure, sustainable housing for all is the foundation of a thriving community. And we know that home ownership brings substantial social benefits for families and communities. This year, NVAR has supported proposals to expand opportunities for homeowners to build and to utilize accessory dwelling units on residential properties in Fairfax County and the city of Alexandria. These dwellings have the potential to incrementally increase the supply of homes by leveraging existing housing on already developed land. At the state level, we've worked on legislation to provide financial incentives for law enforcement officers, firefighters, emergency medical services personnel, and teachers to purchase homes. And with the advent of the pandemic, much of our state legislative focus has been on preventing renters from losing their dwelling as a result of financial hardship. At the national level last year, Realtors made housing affordability one of the association's top advocacy priorities and hosted a policy forum aimed at tackling the issue. The availability of affordable housing is critical to all of us who live and work in this region and to the economic future of Northern Virginia. According to the National Association of Realtors, our country is facing the lowest inventory of homes since they began collecting the data in 1999. And since 2012, homes have become less affordable. NAR's 2020 survey of Northern Virginia home buyers and sellers showed that the median income for buyers in our region was $165,000. And in 
NAR's data last year also showed us that for households in the region with income levels of $100,000, only 36% of available housing inventory was affordable. And that's 4% lower than the previous year. For households earning $50,000, only 6.3% of available homes were affordable. And that's why today's conversation is so significant for our region's future. We value our long-standing partnership with the George Mason University Center for Original Analysis to study economic trends and their impacts on residential real estate. We do this not only to help our members serve their clients, but also as a resource to the community. Realtors are champions of the American dream of home ownership, but they are also advocates for the importance of sustainable housing for all. And integral to that mission is our commitment to fair housing, which is embedded in the Realtor Code of Ethics. It's one of the things that sets us apart as real estate professionals. Working together to educate members of the community, elected officials, and the media, it's critical to creating positive change. We're dedicated to being a part of the solution that keeps Northern Virginia at the epicenter of innovation. NVAR and our Realtor members have been the guiding influence to Northern Virginia's region for over 100 years. As we celebrate our centennial this year, we remain dedicated to serving the housing needs of all who wish to call Northern Virginia home and to helping foster affordable, accessible, inclusive, and thriving communities. Thank you for attending today's symposium. Great schools, jobs, and entertainment make Fairfax County an excellent place to live, work, play, and raise a family. And guess what? The word is out. out. Our community is home to more than a million residents and our growing economy is bringing in more opportunities for jobs at every level of the income spectrum. Fairfax County's housing market has reached a pivotal crossroads in providing homes that are affordable for residents at all income levels, but especially for households with lower to moderate incomes. So, what does it mean to have a home that is affordable? In general, having an affordable home means you have enough income to pay your housing expenses and still have enough money left over to provide for your basic needs like food, clothing, and medical care. Ideally, your housing expenses should not exceed 30% of your income. With the average rent in Fairfax County costing about $1,877, this means that households need to earn an average of about $75,000 per year to live in an affordable home. For many essential workers in our community, like teachers, store clerks, restaurant workers, and childcare providers, the average cost of housing in the county is simply out of reach. Why is affordable housing so important? Well, today, in Fairfax County, about one in five renters spend more than 50% of their income on housing costs. And as rents continue to rise faster than income, workers have fewer and fewer opportunities to find housing here, pushing them and their families out of the communities where they work. Every resident needs a decent, safe, and affordable home. Affordable homes provide a platform for everyone to achieve their fullest potential. And they help us to become the kind of community we want to be. One Fairfax. How does Fairfax County work to create more affordable housing opportunities? The Redevelopment and Housing Authority and the Department of Housing and Community Development work to enhance affordable housing opportunities in three main ways. We build new and rehabilitate existing affordable homes. We invest local, state, and federal funds to help finance private and nonprofit new construction or rehabilitation of affordable homes. We implement policies to encourage the inclusion of affordable homes in market rate developments. Affordable homes look just like all the types of housing we have. They can be townhouses, single-family homes, manufactured homes, or even multifamily apartment buildings. The bottom line is that we need more homes that are affordable to sustain our growing economy and workforce. With continued community support, we can make sure that everyone has the opportunity to have a safe and decent place to call home in Fairfax County. 
to learn more about Fairfax County housing initiatives and programs, follow us on Facebook at Fairfax County Housing and visit us online at fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash housing. Home is where I live near my friends. Home is where I can get to work on just one bus. Home is where I can afford the rent and the birthday presents. Home is where the kids can play outside. Home is a dinner table and a family around it. Home is a place that's just the way I left it. Home is where we grow up. Home is where our futures start. But for many, home is more than hard work alone can achieve. It's hard to dream if you don't know where you'll lay your head at night. So who's to say who gets to dream?